What's up everybody? So my name's Russ with rwgresearch.com and this particular video is a winter project that I did. Um, the parts for this project were um, donated by an individual and a lot of the other stuff was just resourced out of uh, random things I had laying around. So in this video you're going to actually see me build a what they call a Rostock, I believe that's pronounced right, 3D Delta configurated printer. So it runs on three points Instead of XYZ, it runs on the triangulation coordinate system. There's only three arms with an end effector. It's a really unique type of uh, machine. It's kind of newer. Uh, I think the, the individual who designed it, um, open source prototyped everything, uh, maybe about a year ago at this day. Um, this is, uh, let's see, uh, 320, 2013. So, um, yeah, so all the information in this video, if you want to watch it from start to finish, it's a pretty lengthy documentary, but I wanted to try to give you guys, the, the viewers, an incomplete everything from start to finish. Uh, that's including some software, that's including how to actually create the files, that's including printing, I mean, the entire thing from start to finish. So, the beginning is a lot of photographs, build, 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 and then there's some videos here and there mixed in. Um, of uh, what I did as I progressed, but most of it is pictures. Towards the end, you get a lot more videos. Um, normally, when I do such a build, um, I document it like the entire length, all the way through, and I videotape a whole bunch of stuff. This time, I decided to do it a little different. Just take pictures, and then I did a voiceover over the pictures. So I hope you guys really enjoy it. Um, when you get done, finish watching this, leave a comment. Um, but yeah, detailed information here it comes. So let's get started. Alrighty, well here is a picture of the parts and pieces of the printer. This is everything laid out as it is, um, and some of the stuff I didn't use, some of it I did, but most of it is all right there. The power supply that I used is actually a little bit different, but everything else is there. So I'm going to try to make this short and sweet. Uh, these pictures are going to go fairly fast. I'm going to try to get everything in, and I uh, didn't want to drag it out forever long so it's going to be flying by so if you want to stop and watch something uh, the best thing to do is hit pause and look at it here we go alright so here you can see the jig and the carbon fiber rods that I had bought um, I did have to machine down these carbon fiber rods as you can see in this picture um, I had them uh, slightly bigger um, you can find these they use them for kite building and all sorts of stuff they're extremely strong I was very surprised um, luckily I was able to machine them and I had to do that to fit on the plastic ends that we um, had printed. So there they are, that is sitting in the jig and the reason that it's, uh, I may have to make a jig is because they're all exactly 250 millimeters from um, end to end. So this way they're all exactly the same. Um, here you can see them all just uh, sitting there. This was before I glued them, but they're all exactly the same length and uh, it actually turned out very well and the jig was extremely helpful. I recommend building a jig of some kind if you're going to do this. So here is the end effector and it's basically just uh, uh, plastic printed parts. Um, it's all put together and then I added the arms and uh, again everything is printed plastic parts except for the rods and the bolts. So pretty cool. Now I will need to actually replace the joints because um, they're all printed plastic parts and they're going to wear out extremely fast. But surprisingly, uh, they work really well. That's one thing on my list that I need to replace or make something with bearings in it um, because it's definitely going to be needed. Um, but, I mean, it does work. I, uh, very, very interestingly, it works quite well. But I will need to replace them. So um, in this picture you can see the motor mounts and the motors. Um, these are NEMA 17 and they're just little stepper motors. You can find them online. Um, I think I bought, I needed four of them for this one. So uh, it worked out pretty well. These mounts uh, are all plastic printed. Here's starting on the base. Uh, this is three sheets laid out together to make a circle and that is how you lay out your um, there's a diagram of it that's how you lay out the bed and every everything that needs to be mounted to it 
So here you can see I came up with this shape. Now the reason I did this is because I just made, wanted to make it a little bit different. Um, normally it had some square back corners, but mine doesn't. Here you can see some little pin holes I placed. I did this so that I can mark the wood and drill the holes in the right spot. So here I took MDF, Media Density Fiber Board, and went ahead and just uh, cut that exact same shape and cut two of them together. And then went ahead and mounted the top um, slide rail holders, the bottom slide rail holders. Um, the top hold the motors, or the bottom holds the motors and the top holds the bearings. Um, I went ahead and used regular wood screws directly into that plastic. They happen to be the, the correct size, so I went ahead and did that, and it seems to be working pretty well. Alright, so uh, you can see here the top side has a little notch, and the bottom side has a notch where the zip ties go through. Um, I went ahead and cut those out with a Dremel so that they didn't hit my bolt heads because my bolt heads are a little bit bigger than uh, I could have used. So there you can see how I, why I did that. Here it is uh, all together. Uh, those rods are 8mm drill rods and they do have um, actual slide bearings on them. Um, they seem to work pretty well. Uh, they were a little tight here and there but they seem to be working out okay. Um, this little short video clip is me moving the end effector by hand. Um, so we'll just see what it looks like. It moves really, really freely. Um, so as you can tell, it works, works really well. All right, so here we're back to building. I went ahead and added some fans. Those uh, fans happen to be exactly the right size. So I just cut off some screws and ran them right into the bottom of that printed plastic part. And it seemed to fit pretty well. That's just to keep them cool. Um, you can see it's a pretty short clearance there. Um, the motors really don't get that hot, but I'm sure the fans help if I would run this thing 24-7. So here's what it looks like. A little bit overview. I moved up the bottom and the top so I could mount my electronics underneath. So that's kind of why I have it uh, mounted higher. Um, I thought I could get everything compacted under. Uh, it happened that I, I was able to do that. Now there's a printed plastic pulley, but I went ahead and, and got some different pulleys because the printed ones weren't that great. Um, they just weren't round enough. So here is a quick shot of how the belt goes through there. And then the next slide here you can see I added a zip tie so that I do not pull the, um, the little plastic part off to the, the right side there. And this holds everything in place and nice and tight. Now this could be redesigned a lot better but that's just the way the parts were printed and designed. This is a prototype, don't forget. And then this happened. Um, I figured out later that these need to be completely re-engineered and uh, this actually holds the belt tension. And so if you're trying to uh, tighten them down to hold those belts tight, you end up breaking them. And of course the zip tie comes to the rescue. Um, I added the zip ties around the things to try to hold it together. Later I actually drilled holes in here. Um, uh, they broke a couple more. Drilled holes in there differently. I'll, I'll show you in the next couple of slides, but that was a pretty cheesy, quick, easy fix. Uh, you can see the belt is attached in that photograph. Um, the belts are attached here, and again I, I over tightened everything, and um, yeah, it was a bad deal. Um, learned my lesson the hard way, and uh, come up with a different solution that I show in the videos a little bit later. So here you can see the belts all nice and tight and the slides are attached and they're just zip tied onto the end effector arms. Um, those are the plastic pulleys instead of the printed ones because they, those printed ones just weren't precise enough and I could not get them on the motor. Now the top, I added this angled plate against the side to hold everything a little bit more square. So I put angled plates right there and the reason that I did that um, you can see some screws in the side, but the reason I put those plates up there is so I can put clamps on there, so every time I need to make an adjustment to the belt, I can do that. So here's the motor. Um, I had to actually press the shaft out. Um, I had to take the motor completely apart, as you can see here. Um, the shaft had a double-ended shaft on this motor, and it wasn't long enough for the type of extruder that I built. So I had to actually move the whole entire thing, and that was a little tricky. I wouldn't recommend doing that unless you're certain that you can put it back together, because these things are very precise. Um, as you can see it used to be over about an, uh, not quite an inch, maybe three quarters of an inch. I actually moved the entire rotor down. There you can see it just barely sticking out or before it had a good uh, three quarters of an inch probably. 
and this way it allows me to mount the uh, little uh, gear um, that uh, was actually made. Jeff actually made that, and I kind of finished it a little bit to make it smoother. There it is all together. Um, you can see the plastic runs through there. This is similar setup to the way a, um, a wire-fed welder works, and that the wheel just compresses onto it, and since that gear is kind of pointy and sharp, it digs into the plastic. This is actually how the plastic gets into the extruder head. It gets forced in there. Um, and this is constantly being controlled with the end effector so that it all actually fits and works together and pushes plastic out at the right time. So it was pretty uh, pretty interesting. Um, you can see the springs on top actually just hold that bearing pushed against that. And um, you can see there's another bearing on there that helps support the force onto that shaft because I didn't want to bend it. So pretty pretty cool design. I didn't design that. This was printed by another individual. Um, I don't remember the name. So now, let's move on to the hot end. Um, this is the hot end. Jeff actually made it. Um, I wrapped the um, Kapton tape, is what they call it, on there, and added a thermal resistor. And this is how I checked the temperature. So it's actually a coil wrapped around a, um, a brass, uh, threaded brass rod, and then the end there is machined and threaded onto that. That has a 0.5 millimeter end. And uh, the backside is a particular plastic. I don't remember what it's called. The little white thing is uh, PTF, P or E or something. Um, it's really high temperature stuff. It's like a... Um, uh, that little piece is Teflon. Uh, I shined the light through it there, as you saw. That's just so I could see it. And here it is next to the other part um, that actually holds it in place. Now, I took an aluminum plate and I milled this out, this shape out. And then I kind of polished it up, cut it down a little bit with a, a hand wheel, and I cut a notch in there so that you could slide the hot end right inside, um, and this allowed to compress the top part onto the hot end, and that's what actually holds the hot end in place. It's the only thing actually that holds it in place. Um, there you can see the notch that I cut out, and that was designed just to slip onto the hot end. Um, this hot end was already cut in a particular manner, so I just worked around it. And uh, in this next photograph, you'll actually be able to see how it fits on there. There's a little bitty gap, and the top plastic part was printed, and it just gets clamped onto there. And this, this is the only thing that holds it in place. Um, that little white piece, that's the, the piece of Teflon tubing. Um, PTFE. And there it is together. You see about the size of it. It's about, oh, what, eh, three and a half inches long total. Um, hot end's probably like two and a half. Alright, here's the electronics. I started working on just setting up the actual electronics to download it, and this came with a screen. And, um, oh, here's a nice error. You cannot save the sketch into a folder inside itself. This would go on forever. <laughs> uh, the Arduino software gave me that. So we'll come back to that, but uh, that's what I was doing there. Now here is the setup for the hot, the hot bed, the, the bed. Now originally, I designed it so I could, uh, if the head crashed, it would push a limit switch underneath the bed. Uh, all the way into the bottom. There you can see I had springs on there, and that's the hotbed. That's a piece of PBC printed and is used as a as a heating element. So you can see the springs, and what I was going to do is attach little limit switches underneath, so that whole bolt moves through that entire thing. And um, so you, I, I decided to change that, but that's what the idea was there. So we'll come back to it. Here's my better fix on my zip ties. I broke a few more of these trying to get this thing tight. Finally decided to do it a totally different way, which is coming up in the video here. So there you can see, I just drilled holes right in that thing and just strapped it on there. Uh, that's probably one of the first things I'll print. So here I decided to make limit switch. Um, I'm using Hall Effect limit switch for the end effector stops. And so I, I actually milled this little piece of plastic out and um, so I decided to make a little bitty tiny pieces, which if I had the printer done, I could have just printed them. But I didn't, so we had to do it the hard way. Um, this is where the printer would come in handy, make these little pieces and oddball parts. But I wanted a way to stop the, uh, stop the belts and the end effectors from over travel. There you can see I, I put a magnet on there. Um, normally what they do is put limit switches on both sides, and you mechanically trigger the limit switch. There they all are together. Um, now I made one for the top and one for the bottom. 
but I changed my mind. I'll show you here coming up. These are the mounts for the Hall Effect um, end stops. Basically, I just used scrap that I had left over um, from that other milling uh, project there. Drilled the right holes in the right spot, and uh, everything seemed to fit quite well. The long hole there is what actually holds it to the base plate. The other two holes hold the actual um, device. Here you can see that the two slots I cut out um, actually were worked out well because of the solder joints on the bottom. Those two slots actually fit inside the belt for the uh, end piece, so that's where that comes into play. Here they all are mounted, and then I mount them on the, the jig. Uh, here's where the little magnet parts come into play. Now one goes up and one goes down. I did this so that I could actually just use a single end stop and then use two magnets on on this on the belt to actually stop the upper level and the lower level there you can see the magnet triggering the end stop hall effect sensor um, now I actually decided to remove there's the bottom that, that's the top travel the other one was the bottom travel I actually decided to remove the bottom travel because if it's gonna go all the way down there and jam out it's you are just you're done that's just it um, it never it never really is gonna get down that far before the hot end hits the bed so it's just I just took it off because of that reason right there. They wanted to try to stick to each other, and I couldn't get them to read well. So I put a bigger magnet on there, and um, it, it worked out a little bit better. All right, so here is my way of keeping the belt tension. You can see the shaft collar that I placed on here. I spent a while, I built a bunch of different little things, and finally gave up. Came back to this simple idea that ran across my head. Um, so this way I don't try to over-tighten the top clamps and break the plastic. I just have some uh, some shaft collars on there. These were 5 eighths, I think, and I had to drill them out to fit on the 5 millimeter. So, yeah. So there it is in total. I think those are 5 sixteenths. Sorry. And I had to drill them out to fit on the, the, the size. So these are little end stop pieces. I, I cut them off because I wasn't going to use them for my end stop. So I cut them off, but I wanted to use them. I snapped them on to the bottom side of those rails and used them to mount that to the base plate. I actually added another base plate you'll see here coming up. There's the base plate. So I drilled the center hole for a fan and all the other holes you see there for mounting um, the base which you can see all that's on there now. It's actually top of a tabletop. It's the only thing I could find laying around and uh, so I just grabbed it and whacked it up because I have a whole bunch of them. Um, so there is the front and the back two three pillars and now this has a three point um, like to keep everything square there's three points between those rods because it was pretty flimsy there you can see I've got a C clamp or a, a, a clamp on the top uh, just to hold the top in place here I remodified the bed and added a short piece of uh, uh, polycarbonate on the bottom and I did this so that the fan blowing against the bottom didn't cool the heat bed but just disperse the heat I didn't want all that heat onto my onto my base and to try to keep everything nice and square and not overheat and tweak it and stuff. That was my my fix. So these this is hard. Um, no, it's solid. There is no limit switches added on there like I was telling you before. I took all that off and then redid it like this. Now those are all threaded. I can adjust them and square the bed um, just by threading those big round things. They came out of hard drives, or, uh, recycled material, so it works well. Here you can see the, the LCD display and the rotary encoder knob. It's a push button and a rotary encoder. So I, I cut these little pieces of plastic out of polycarbonate, which I should have uh, weighted again and just printed them. Uh, but that's okay. So that holds that LCD screen. And um, that's just how it sits on there. I had to cut all those notches for the SD card to fit on there and the bolt heads that I've attached it to the front. Uh, to get all that to fit, I had to cut all them notches out of there and stuff. So there it is without the LCD. And that's just two, um, I don't know how many pins those are. Those go back to the Arduino. That uh, just plugs right into the top of the ramps board. I did get a ramps 1.4. So there's the SD card. And just slips right in there. And boom, you can run right from the SD card. You don't even need a computer at all. Uh, it's definitely easier with a computer, but you don't need it. It's kind of kind of cool. Um, actually seemed to seem to work out pretty well alrighty so here's what it looks like as of this day um, that I was working on it um, I was pretty excited it looks somewhat like a printer um, pretty pretty interesting pretty cool 
So I couldn't wait to get this thing going, but I still had a lot of work to do. So next, we're going to start working on the electronics. Here is a Dell power supply. Um, I took it out of a computer that I had sitting around. Luckily, it had just the right amount of power. As you can see, there is uh, 16 uh, amps total that I needed on the 12-volt side, so this was perfect. This actually worked out just right. So it seemed to work out pretty well. Uh, just the right amount of power. So I went ahead and whacked all the cords off of it. Didn't need them. Um, so you can see the green cord hanging out there. The only one I left at the time because that's the power trigger wire. You need to short that to ground to get this uh, ATX power supply to actually turn on. So there it is. You can see which pin it is if you wanted to um, do this yourself. Or you can make a benchtop power supply. I've done that before. Um, I went ahead and just cut all the wires off. They were marked already. You can see 3.3 volt, 12 volt, 5 volt. And then I desoldered all those, calculated out the amount of current I was going to be consuming, and then rewired everything. As you can see there, I only rewired the 5 volt and 12 volt, and a um, DC ground for the switch, and that was about it. Um, so here you can see I started mounting some standoffs for the Arduino. Um, here are some little bitty insulators that I cut up from some old hard drives that I used to shim, shim it off the uh, Arduino. Now, I had to cut the couple of pins around the holes completely down, and um, I had to, had to do that because I didn't want them shorting out. So I mounted the ramps on top of the Arduino, everything right on the front, or on the side of the, the, the base plates. Um, that actually worked out really well. Um, here's a cooler fan. It's not a fan that cools, but it's a cooler fan. That's right, I have a cooler fan than you. <laughs> anyway, it just came with it. <laughs> So, there's the extruder motor that I mounted on the side, and um, that was the other side, and that, that seemed to work out really well. You can see the uh, Teflon tubing, it's a 2mm inside diameter, 4mm outside diameter, um, and we'll get back to that. So here is the 5 volt power rail that I built. Um, you can run 12 volt fans off of 5 volt power and run them at like half speed. You can also put a controlling circuit on there and just lower the voltage and they run slower. I didn't need these fans running at full speed, but I wanted to just move air. So I ran everything with 12 volt fans, I ran them back to the 5 volt power rail, as you can see right there. So everything's mounted on little standoffs and plugged in. Um, that worked out really well. Now moving on to the power supply. Luckily this was a clip-in power supply and you can see I just put bolts right in where the clip-ins used to be. Um, and then just drilled holes and mounted that thing right on the inside. Um, this is the opposite side of where the extruder sits. So I did have to drill some deep holes and get it mounted in there. It's laying on its side right now. That's why the pictures look kind of funny. So the power supply is mounted. Ran the wires where I wanted them. Hooked them all up. Um, just DC power. That's all it was. Um, and then the Arduino. That was a little bit of a trick. Those are some pretty big wires. I believe I used uh, 8 uh, AWG and 12 AWG and then for the 5 volt I used 5 AWG and that was the correct current rating for that wire um, I don't know if I'll be pulling that much but I went ahead and sized them correctly anyway so here there's a 5 volt power rail connected um, the whole base, oh there it is, I had the little power wires shorted together to turn on the first time I turned it on I was pretty excited to just see it come on um, and then, so that's what it looked like as of that day. And uh, next, I'm going to show you what I did to the base. Here's the base. I originally cut this out of a table. Well, I stripped the sides off before I cut it up. Gave the sides to my dad. Um, and he's a carpenter. He's beyond ridiculously perfect. He just he, He's just that type of guy I kind of resemble. And you might see in some of my work, I'm kind of almost anal uh, about my work because I like it to be done correct. So here's what he did. He put it on the side. And uh, voila, it looks like its own little tabletop. And it actually it looks pretty clean, or he did a good job. I'm really liking it. Well, moving back to the hot end, um, I had to redo some stuff, and this is what the pieces were that I redid. Now, um, I've got some aluminum standoffs that I turned down. I actually didn't use those because they weigh too much. The brass coupling there, I notched out, cut, and drilled, um, and I drilled the inside out. And I did this because I wanted to, to cool the hot end without touching it, which you'll see here in a little bit. So the top part that I had earlier, I drilled two holes in it to mount that bottom brass piece. And that brass piece goes around, goes around the hot end, as you can see there. Now, it's not touching the hot end, 
but it does go around the hot end. Um, you can see right there it doesn't touch. And that's because I didn't want to cool the whole hot end. I just wanted to cool the air around it. And so the the um, the brass part actually the, the threads kind of act as heat sink fins and cool the whole thing. I probably could have got away with not doing this at all, but I was kind of afraid of overheating the plastic around the hot end because it's the same temperature that I'm using to melt plastic. So I decided to try to keep the hot end cool um, on the outside without uh, actually touching the hot end. Seems to work pretty well, um, but it is a little bit more heavy than I would have liked. Um, but hey, it's working. So this is a piece of a 3 8 copper tube that I cut and bent and shaped um, with a couple of hand tools actually nothing fancy and then this was actually my heat my, my cool tube see instead of adding fans on the end effector which I did not want to do I decided to take this piece of copper and run air through it um, and around those fins and so here it is after I silver soldered it to the actual um, piece of brass and that that worked out pretty well um, I'm still thinking I need to cool the plastic when I print because it's kind of fishy but uh, you know I, I'll i still be adding some changes in here this is just as it was as I'm doing it so there it is silver soldered it on there so it didn't overheat um, not regular solder which may work but the hot end gets pretty hot I'm using ABS plastic so it gets pretty warm now what I did is I actually took a squirrel cage fan and uh, took a block and uh, drilled two three-eighths holes in it and uh, took some silicone glue glued it right onto the front of that squirrel cage fan. This squirrel cage fan was just come out of an old computer I had laying around. I've only got a couple of them. Uh, this thing puts out some pretty good air and even I did some testing even with cutting off the air circulation like that um, as long as you don't blow it down a really really long tube it actually forces air through there pretty well but you can just cut it off and the fan just overspeeds and doesn't really help you here's a close-up of it if you want to look the fan up that's what I'm actually using now I actually did take this fan mount it right next to the hot end extruder took a piece of copper tubing and bent it I'm actually blowing air I'm using it to cool down the extruder motor it looks steampunky it's kind of fun actually it'd be fun to build a steampunk version of a con of a 3D printer, something similar to this. But there you can see it mounted. Now the black hose I replaced with a different hose, but that goes up to the hot end. Um, that's what cools it. That goes to that other copper tube. So there's the hot end mounted. Now later I did replace again the silver standoffs with some plastic ones I had because they just extra added weight. I thought maybe it would help cool everything, but eh, it, it wasn't needed. So I went ahead and uh, and took them off and put plastic ones on. There you can see how it. it the uh, cooling tube I put on there comes right out of the corner and shouldn't hit anything um, and it, it, it does fairly well the the uh, end effector hits before that part so here you can see I've got the black holes connected with a coupling and again later I change this to a piece of latex because it moves a lot better there you can see the Teflon tubing and the other rubber hose that I had at the time mounted so you can see how it kind of moves around Oh, I added a power switch on the front, connected to this uh, to the five volt power rail for that little LED, and then the other part just goes back to that green wire I showed you on the power supply, and actually turns it on and off. The whole power supply turns on and off. Now I can actually set that up to control it with the software to turn on and off like that, but eh, not 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 needed, so I didn't do that. Now off to the wiring. This wiring I actually. Um, started out with wiring like this from the kit and then I took it on my drill and I wrapped them up so that they're all nice and neat and tight and I didn't have to add anything around them to keep them nice they just held themselves in place um, I recommend doing that and then you can still add something around the outside if you want to now here is a the two uh, red ones uh, ends are from old fans I use you can see they're different than the black one um, the reason that I did that was because I wanted to use them for the end stops, but the fans were different. So beware, the colors need to be switched around if you're going to be using the colors. Um, just make sure you pay attention to that. Alright, so here is a little USB extension that I made. Um, I wanted to be able to plug right into the front of this thing. So I took an old little piece of breadboard um, 
and just soldered my wires to it. I took the other part out of a uh, old printer. Uh, and then I just cut a square hole. <laughs> that was fun. A lot of filing. And cut a square hole out and put three screws there, which should have been plenty. Mounted that thing right on the back. And I took a piece of copper and soldered it across there to hold that thing in place. Just soldered it right to the back of the board. And uh, then plugged the other end in, ran it around, and plugged it into the Arduino. This way, I could actually um, uh, plug it in from the front, just like there, and not have to worry about plugging it into the Arduino on the back side. So everything's in the front. Power, controls, and the uh, data port. So there's what it looks like. Um, so this upcoming video here is going to be um, the very, very first thing that I did. First time ever moving it. Here's what happened. So, as you can see, every time I hit the home button on the computer, it just moved a little and stopped. And I, I originally couldn't figure out what the problem was. Um, so, I, I moved it up and did it again until it got to the top. Once it got to the top and actually hit the limits, it seemed to, uh, it seemed to stop. Now, later, what I figured out was that I had the end stops enabled backwards. So, they were normally closed instead of open, normally open instead of closed. There you can see I ran it to the top. So here's the first time I actually had it moving. And I was Ooh. I was excited. Um, it, it was moving it by hand with the software print run on the computer. I'm using the keypad to do that. Hi, Kitty. Now, let's try a home button. So homing again still did not work, and the reason why was because of doesn't work right. But. Was of uh, my limits. Now here it is. I just kind of got it close to the glass surface. It's just sitting there. I wanted to see how level it was, um, and then as I'm moving it around, I decided to run it into the wall, which was awesome. Right there, yeah. <laughs> but uh, that's just limitations on the software that I can set up where I want that to print. Uh, bed to be assigned to um, virtually and then it won't ever hit the wall but at the time I'm moving it by hand it'll run into whatever you want it to the limits uh, weren't set yet this is the first time I ever got it moved I was, I was so excited to see it move around um, I was I was just stoked so I actually did some drawing with it um, which I'll show you up here in a second So here it is, homing. I finally figured out the end stops. And I took the hot end off there and put a pencil on there. So I'm just moving it around manually. But uh, I didn't take any pictures of me drawing with it. But I just drew with it by hand with the keypad. So it's pretty cool. Cool to see it move after that much work. Here it is, uh, homing again from an odd position. So there you go. This is what I drew. I drew some squares, but that's because the software moved 10 millimeters. All right, so you can see that the uh, it's pretty precise. This was every 10 millimeters I made a mark uh, with the printer, and it's pretty darn accurate. So in this video clip, you're going to actually see um, real speed. This is real speed. I didn't change this of me drawing a 4-inch diameter circle with a 2-inch inside diameter. So basically, it's a 1-inch width. And uh, I just ran it pretending like I was printing plastic, but I ran it at a lot faster speed than I was, you know, that you can really print at with this printer. But uh, but just to show it, it'll move. It'll move really fast, and uh, it's pretty cool to watch. So here you go, regular speed. If you'd like to, you can jump to about 35 minutes and 40 seconds to kind of jump this segment. It's about three minutes long, uh, but it's pretty cool to watch.
pretty good sized circle. A little bit more to try to figure out my level. Not quite level yet. So this is high speed of me drawing something for my wife. Of course, got to draw something for my wife or else she wouldn't enjoy it either. <laughs> so I, I just drew this up in SketchUp and grabbed it and there it is. I love you, but it's really precise. I was extremely impressed. So pretty darn cool. Um, I couldn't get, I couldn't wait to get printing with plastic, but I still had work to do. So there it is. Um, just a close shot. Uh, and of course, I had to draw my name. Why not? So there it is. That's actually pretty tiny. That's only uh, about three quarters of an inch tall. So now, well. We're back to building. So these little pieces that you see uh, are just some parts that I made to mount everything together. Now that little nut you see on there holds the little Teflon tubing and the plastic slides through that Teflon tubing as a guide. The washer is just mounted on there so I can bolt it to the side of my framework. Uh, here you can see a little uh, uh, clamp uh, mounted and welded to a bearing with little pieces of metal holding it all together. Um, there's the pulley, uh, the wheels that I'm using to hold the plastic. Um, that's just to hold the plastic spool. And there's a little, uh, there's a piece of metal in the middle with a plastic thing on the outside. These are all recycled parts. I don't know what just half the stuff would be called. But these are all recycled parts from some old, uh, printer, uh, devices that I had that I've scrapped out in the past. But the, the outside there, you can see the two, the metal plate that's right there. Um, I mounted that. Uh, bushing right there with the metal side, the aluminum metal side, and mounted the other side with the aluminum face on it, so that when I compressed it together, it acted as a uh, like a uh, like a spring to hold tension or a tensioner. This way, the plastic didn't fly off the spool and get all wound up and get caught, and that would just be bad. So there it is, all mounted together. So you can see, uh, I took that little clamp and the bearing. I used the bearing because it has nice edges, and. Uh, that seems to be the best for things when you run things into things with wire or plastic or whatever. It seems to make a nice guide. But I'm able to move that to wherever how big the spool is and uh, uh, ran that uh, Teflon tubing down to the bottom and right into the bottom um, and ran the Teflon tubing out to the top right to the hot end. So um, that's what it looked like with the mount on it. So now we get to do the hot end. Oh, I had a little issue here. Um... I decided to uh, make this better and I'll explain why. I took apart a brush and a metal brush, stainless brush actually, and took this little piece of block of uh, UHMW and I pressed those brush bristles into that and um, then took two pens and stuck them into the sides at angles and those pens get pressed into the, uh, well there you can see the, the brushes poking out at just the right length. And I, I mounted all this onto the hot end. Uh, extruder motor because this this brush what it does it brushes out plastic um, because what happened is uh, I had a little problem and um, it, I was trying to push too much plastic into there and the little gear got piled up with plastic so I had to find a way to brush it out while it was running so since the stepper motor kinda goes forward backward forward backward I was able to, to make this little brush holder and uh, it brushes off the little gear so that's that's what it does um, there you can see where the backside doesn't uh, allow the brushes to push out because of those pens. Well, up, we're going to work with glass. Um, here you can see I'm cutting a piece of glass, which I thought was not tempered, but it just so happened to be tempered. And I thought it wasn't, though. I tried to break it, and it's actually really funny, and you're just going to have to watch. I had bad experience with cutting glass. I was going to use this as my print surface. It's all recycled, so I just had to use what I had. So, yeah. Then, this happened. Tempered glass. Dress. Yeah, so the moral of the story is, wear gloves. Alrighty, so I decided to grab a different piece of glass. This is actually out of the back of a rear projection TV. 
super high quality glass so I had it thought I'd grab it and try to cut it instead and see uh, see how that worked out for me and uh, well then this uh, this occurred Well, that broke easier than I thought. Yeah, so I did uh, actually was able to use the parts, but the darn thing fell off. And luckily I had some super thick jeans on because uh, it actually hit my knee and probably would have ripped me a good one. Probably would have been in the hospital, but somehow, some way, I was saved. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so... I finally did get those finished and they that is actually what I'm using as my print surface right now and it, it does seem to work fairly fairly well but uh, still messing with that part so awesome sauce now we're getting close to printing alright so you can see in this picture I have the uh, components that go to the hot end uh, and then here I took a recycled piece of uh, stuff you slip wire in um, and just slipped it over top. Turned out really well. Alright, so now it comes software. This is probably the most difficult thing that I've actually had with this printer so far is the software. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay. If, for some reason, you do not want to watch the software portion because it's fairly lengthy, uh, go ahead and jump to one hour and two minutes. It's a good spot. Alright, the first thing you're going to want to do is go to open-source-energy.org and scroll down and you're going to find a link that says uh, RipRap 3D Extruding. And then you're going to find another link that says The Adventure of Building a Delta 3D Printer somewhere on here in the forum pages or at the beginning I may change it there will be a place to download a file and this file will contain everything you need uh, once you download it you'll see that everything in the folder looks like this now in this folder there is a readme file this is what's in the readme file I recommend you just follow their steps but I'm gonna attempt to go through it hopefully I get it all right so you're gonna to go to folder number one and install this first program and I will fast forward through this because it takes a little bit alright and once that is done you go back to folder number two and install this program after that one is complete go to number three and install that program Alright, once that's done, I accidentally unchecked that box right there, but I should have left it checked. Hit finish, and it will run through a bunch of random stuff, and it's installing things in the background that you will need to continue installing the uh, rest of the software. So after that, let's go on to folder number four and install this program. Alrighty, so we are finished with the first four. So we're going to go back to folder number 5. Now this one's in a zip file. You're going to have to unzip it and then you will be able to open up the folder. So I just dragged it and dropped it, unzipped it, opened it up, and inside here there will be this setup. Okay, you're going to want to click on it, it's going to run a batch file, and that's it. Now there is a readme file in there if you want to look at it, um, and it may jog your memory on what you need to do in case I missed something in these couple of steps. So now we're going to go back and install the Arduino software. You can download it from their website. I happen to get a um, lower version, it's not the newest version, and this is because that's what was recommended at the time. So you can open it, you're going to have to unzip it. This does take a little while. Once it's unzipped, you'll um, have to go to the folder, open it up, and you'll find the Arduino program. 
you're going to open this up. Now, there's a few tricks with this. I actually don't have my board plugged in, so you're going to have to uh, bear with me some of the errors that I'm going to be getting. But you're going to go find the software that I've already got, the Marlin software. Okay, it's right there, and underneath Marlin, there's a folder, and inside there, there's a file called Marlin. Okay, it's towards the bottom. You're going to want to make sure you know where that's located because you're going to have to open up that file. If you don't do it correctly, you won't open all the files. So go back to the Arduino program, go to File, go to Open, find that file that actually says Marlin, wherever it's at on your hard drive. Once you find it, open it and you will find out that you will get a whole a new window first of all you're going to want to just go close the other one you don't need it and there you go now you've got all of the configuration files on top there's a bunch of tabs okay and those tabs tell you each individual step in in the programming there's different pages so you can easily get through your programming it's just a nice way to lay it out so you're going to want to go to your board up here and actually select the Mega 256 and then there's also a serial port right there below right there below that one that I'm pointing at and uh, you'll actually be able to select the serial port that you're connected to now because it's not plugged in I don't have it um, you will need the uh, drivers for the Arduino software you can open up your device properties under the uh, serial bus you can actually find it there it'll tell you which COM port it's connected to You'll need to know that, and then you can go into the software, uh, the uh, um, Arduino software, and select the serial port. Now, the most important thing here is the configuration file. There's a whole bunch of different settings in here, and you're going to need to know all of these different settings on your particular build. Everyone is could be slightly different. Um, a lot of the problems that I was explaining with the in stops. Um, you'll actually have to set them. Um, right here is where you set them. I set mine to true instead of false and that inverted them. That was one of the issues I had so I actually had to change that. Uh, the LCD screen settings are in here. All of those things you have to go in. Oh right there is where the um, bed height is. You'll need to set it manually. Um, the LCD screen is here. You can actually select the LCD screen and go through and pick which one you have if you don't have one at all. I have the one with the encoder wheel so I can set everything manually. Now somewhere in here um, there's also a place to set the revolutions per millimeter or steps per millimeter and that's for the extruder. I actually couldn't find it. Um, you're gonna have to just dig for it and see if you can find it. I'm actually using the front of the printer to set it but I need to set it manually and basically what that is is the extruder turns so many steps so if your drivers are the polo drivers which I'm using on the ramps board you're gonna to have to set those well underneath those are the jumpers they're set to 16 um, steps and that's micro stepping so 16 micro steps so there's 200 steps per rev and you got 16 micro steps I believe that comes out to 3200 steps per revolution then you're gonna to have to basically make it turn one revolution either manually or do it in the software somewhere and measure how much plastic um, came out of your extruder end and measure that and that's the number you're gonna type in there it's um, it's somewhere in the software I actually couldn't find it um, I'll have to dig it up later but that was one important thing if you don't get that set right you're gonna have a lot of issues alright so once you got that going you want to compile it and make sure it's okay in case you made a change that was invalid so you go to up to the top there and hit uh, compile and you'll see it compiling down at the bottom now I actually get an error um, I don't know what it was or why um, but I, I don't have my Arduino connected so you can compile without it connected but for whatever reason it gave me an error so pretend like that's not there and uh, it'll compile it'll say finish all good if it's not you're gonna have to find out why so right there something was wrong and I, I don't really know why um, so after you compile it you're going to go into file and click on download and it will say or upload excuse me and it will be uploading to the board now I don't have the board connected so we'll just pretend like it did it and uh, that would be downloading the firmware into the actual Arduino to run on the ramps I am using Marlin software and uh, that's just the original hacked version for the Delta 
prototype. So that's that's what I've got in this folder. All right, once that's all done, you're going to go back to the original folder and find the, the software that I have saved in there and open up this prompter face. And it's going to bring up a screen like this. Um, you're going to want to put in the serial port right there and you're going to want to connect to it. Now again, I don't have mine plugged in, so I can't do that. It will connect if everything is well. All right, well, while here in the prompter face, go ahead and try the homing function and try to move it around and see what you can come up with. Uh, again, I had a lot of problems, as you saw in my earlier part of this video, where I had to switch the inverting on the switches. I was using the Hall effect switches, and the original uh, person who designed it had uh, mechanical limit switches, and they were just wired up differently. So go ahead and play around with it, and if you can't get it, go back to the configuration file, um, and then we'll, then you can move on to the next phase of software. The next thing you're going to want to do is uh, install your 3D program. I'm using Google SketchUp, so I'm going to show you what you need to do to get Google SketchUp to work and export the correct STL type of file. So go ahead and install Google SketchUp. I've included it here in the folder, so you can just go ahead and follow along if you're building something and try it out. Alright, once you're done doing that, you're going to go back to that original folder that you downloaded, and there's a file in there called stl4su.rb. You're going to need to copy that into the directory of SketchUp 8. So you're going to open up the C drive, you're going to find the um, program files, and you're going to find the SketchUp 8 folder. You're going to open that one and find plugins. Okay, you'll need to drop that fold that file into the plugins directory. And what this does is it installs a export utility so that you can export your Google SketchUp 3D model directly to an STL file. All right. So copy that into the correct directory and make sure you've got it there. Now when you open up the program, I'll show you how you can tell. So pop just like that and now it's in there. Alright, now that you've got this far, go ahead and open up Google SketchUp. I'm going to draw a half inch by half inch by half inch cube and go kind of step by step with you and show you how it is. So go to Start Programs and open up the Google SketchUp 8. Once Google SketchUp opens, you're going to have to open a template. I like the feet and inches and then later you can actually get into the decimal points and whatever. Um, the engineering um, um, profile seems to work pretty well but go ahead and pick whichever one that suits you the best and you can figure it out later which one you like you may even already know alright so once Google SketchUp um, opens you can go ahead and uh, close this little dialog box now the first thing that most people don't do and I recommend is going to tools uh, excuse me going to view tools and opening up the large toolbox that puts this toolbox over here on the side which is very helpful so delete this gal bye bye um, so I'm gonna go ahead and draw a half inch um, square and I can usually just point you always go to the center for drawing stuff if you want it to be flat on the plane and uh, I can type in 0.5 comma 0.5 down in the bottom there and it will just automatically show up now it's tiny so you got to scroll way in, and there it is. So now I'm going to um, grab the top of it. Well, first I'm going to align it. Um, you don't necessarily have to, but I'm going to align it. Go ahead and grab the pull tool and pull it up. Type in 0.5, and it will automatically go exactly to 0.5. And there you go. Now we have a um, half-inch cube. So now that we have our cube, we need to go up to tools and if you install that um, patch correctly right there is the export to STL um, and it asks you what uh, type you want I usually put it in millimeters since the Delta bot is all configured in millimeters and then um, leave that as binary go ahead and click the OK and it will ask you to save the file now what you need to, to know here is that you need to save it as a .stl. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and put it in the folder that I have all of this other software in. And I may even go ahead and leave those files there for you in case you want to play with them. Um, so we'll go ahead and label it whatever you want .stl. 
you have to do that or else it doesn't read correctly in the other programs so I'm going to go ahead and type square here and we'll label it and then you're going to hit save and it should save that file for you just like that now that's it you can go ahead and go open up the folder that you saved it in and make sure it's there and the next thing you are going to do is go to the um, software backup files that I have you're gonna go in here um, and find the K slicer program which is the one that I'm using there's other things that you can use um, just look up different slicer programs um, the install files are right there for it you can find it online but I'm gonna go ahead and open up the K slicer program and what this does this is a slicing program designed for 3D printing so there's so many different settings this took forever so if you go into properties advanced settings there's a whole bunch of different stuff there if you're using the configuration files that I've sent you I already have a few presets that works for my printer um, there are just so many different options in here that I spent probably about two weeks just playing with this and the bad thing is is that it really depends on what you're printing um, here in the G-code section I've installed different uh, hand com commands or, or custom commands that allows the heat bed to preheat and the um, temps all to rise and then wait and then it homes automatically because it doesn't do that be aware that if you don't add a home function it will not home and then I have it homing afterwards and setting the temperatures um, that's all custom it'll be in there if you download these otherwise you're gonna have to try to see what I did um, so there's a bunch of different options um, you will like here's the infill um, the destring option here which which basically helps you from from uh, pulling a bunch of little strings like hot glue trying to pull off hot glue it does the same thing with this plastic um, in here there's um, this wipe function which actually is pretty handy but sometimes it'll screw you up so it really depends on what you're printing but basically it wipes it goes over the path when it's done printing a layer and um, just whatever amount of millimeters you want it to and it'll kinda wipe it clean so we're gonna go to open models you have to play with those settings there's so many different things but uh, go ahead and go to open models and go find that STL file that you saved um, so go ahead and find the file. Once you find it, you should be able to just open it. It is the G or the STL file. Open, and it will plop it in there. So there it is in 3D. You can maneuver it. You can view it. Um, this program is really nice because you can see how it's going to slice before you actually try to print something. With the other programs, it's a little bit more tricky. Um, this program seems to work. You can uh, scale it in here if you want. So if you go scale by X and type in let's say five it will scale it five times bigger than what it was okay now over here on your right um, right there there's uh, some settings that you can see you can actually change this, the size of it there as well so we'll go ahead and revert back this is a half inch block um, down here at the bottom and it's kinda cut off on my screen but down here at the bottom um, there are a couple of settings. Right here I'm setting the skirt and I'm inflating it to 10. What this does is it lays one circle of plastic around the outside and gets everything extruded nice before it actually starts printing. Um, you can also lay down a couple of extra layers before you start printing in case you need something to adhere to. And right here there's the speed settings, slow and fast. Okay, If you go back up to your preference advanced settings, right here there is a all speeds there's a low and a high okay that that's what that slider does it picks somewhere in between those or the minimum or maximum I've always got it on slow and I've just got my slowest settings set at my at what prints well and then if I want to try to speed it up I can so I hit slice down there and I sliced it and um, there are different views if you grab this slider you can actually see the different slices okay and um, I'm, I've got it selected up top right now to see it in both 3D and um, slicing. So if I hit just pass, I can see just the pass. Right now I've got select material up there in the pull down menu. It's just material. But if I wanted to, which seems to help, um, really I'm just looking for flaws and making sure it looks like it's going to print right. So if I select their uh, print path or path type, 
it actually shows me different colors. This is different layers. Um, Sometimes you can figure out what speeds they are. So if we hit slice, it pulls up this menu. If you don't want to see that, just hit cancel. But this is how you save it. So you're going to go and save it as a G code file. And you're going to hit save. It'll slice it and export it out. So if you go back into the, the folder that you saved it in, you'll see there it's another file labeled the same thing and it's the G code file. All right. So you're going to want to open up the printer face or copy that file to an SD card and use it that way. Um, here I'm just going to show you open up the printer face program, get it all connected to your printer, and then you're going to just go to load file and select it. And um, it will pull in that G code file and then uh, basically you're you're ready to print you can just uh, hit the print button and it does its thing now make sure you always home this thing the delta bot really needs to be homed because otherwise it just starts printing wherever it is um, unless you add the extra G code in the actual G code file which I've done in the K slicer program already so that is basically the software portion and now we can move on to actually printing are you ready all right so here is printing that square at uh, I believe um, let's see this took about the first time I printed one it was pretty slow it took about 18 minutes to print but I can print one in about eight minutes now that I've got it configured really well so BAM there it is printed out a half inch cube and uh, I was pretty amazed the first time I ran this thing it printed out so good I just could not believe it um, and then the next couple of times I kept playing with settings and it was just, it looked terrible. Here you can see the far left one is the one I printed first and then the rest of them I printed second. Um, I played with the settings, here's a couple that got all screwed up and didn't work out, I had to stop it and reconfigure and slice again and you know try to print it again. Here's what happens when the cube moves off the glass and it just extrudes all over the place. <laughs> um, here's the bottom. You can see how clear it is, uh, or how shiny it is. That's because it's printed right on the glass. So here I'm taking some measurements. I printed a half inch cube. That is eight thousandths off one direction, and only two thousandths off the other direction. Now, the height, the thickness, the top to bottom is actually off quite a bit. But that's because the um, extruder was writing against the glass surface really hard, and that's that's the reason there. But uh, there's one that had that went a little too fast. Um, on accident, I sped it up to like 500% of normal speed. <laughs> Somehow, it still printed. Um, so yeah, so it, it, I was amazed at the at the precision that this thing did. So there's one with the hole, and now we're gonna print objects. So here's some time lapsing, and uh, this here, I'm actually printing. That's right. A bolt. Ta da! So now, oh, you want the nut? Okay. Well, we'll print the nut out. And done. Uh, there you go. I can actually print a nut and bolt, um, I believe, uh, somewhere around 15 minutes for both parts. Um, so that's pretty cool. That's one of the first things I printed. I wanted to see if I could print. And I use that as a calibration. So here I'm printing a um, a triangle that people use for calibration, and uh, I definitely still needed to calibrate it. This took um, over an hour to print. Um, this is pretty fast. So there's a layered on there with an eight millimeter hole in the middle. It's kind of cool to watch it layer. I like that. And then uh, it builds up the corners, and this allows you to check for your bridging capabilities to see if you've got it set right. You can see there's a lot of strings hanging off and stuff. That all has to do with how you calibrate it. But, uh, yeah, there you go. This thing, uh, um, it turned out pretty cool, and there's still so many different settings to play with to make these things, you know, actually print the best quality. So you could play with it for a long time. So here... I am actually printing a small jar with a twist lid on it. So let's go ahead and watch.
So there you go, that took roughly one hour and it has a twisted lid right on top. This was something I downloaded from uh, Thing Universe or whatever it is online. There's a whole bunch of different objects people put on there for free that you can just grab the files and try printing it yourself. I found out a lot of those files don't work very well. You almost have to reconvert them into the STL files. So, but there you go. But uh, I was very cool impressed. Beans. It at works. The uh, quality um, that that printed, and this was watertight. I could put water in there, and with the lid shut, and it would hold water. Um, which I was, I was, I was kind of surprised with the lid, twist lid, just randomly placed on top. All right, so here is a, a vase type of thing. It is a single layer around the outside, one single layer. I wanted to see um, basically how well it stayed together with a single layer, and I was pretty, I was pretty impressed. Um, this is about a 0.5 millimeter width extruding. Um, the aftermath is a little over five millimeters as far as the thickness of a single single layer width. The height is only 0.25 millimeters. So yeah. Here is a uh, little R that I printed with some bridges. I just wanted to see how it would turn out. Um, I also printed uh, obviously the same as my sketch. Did a little name printing just uh, just for fun. I just wanted to see how how it worked out. All right. Well, I tell you what, um, that was some serious documentation. Um, I hope you guys really enjoyed that. But before I go, I wanted to uh, to kind of give you just a quick shot of the. Delta printer that's back here, and some of the little random things that I built um, in the configuration uh, stage. Bunch of different little stuff. I printed off a whole bunch of those little cubes, trying to use those as calibration because I don't use like any plastic. Printed out some dice just for fun, um, nuts and bolts, and here's one of the little uh, um, things, little cup or. Uh, pill bottles, whatever you want to call them. This is a couple of uh, different things that I tried that didn't quite work out. Um, here's some more stuff that um, I've actually printed this, you know, and these bridges. No supports whatsoever. And because of some of the settings, you can see how it didn't turn out all that great. This is um, ABS plastic. Here's some of the scraps that I've got. Some people ask me, well, this stuff isn't very strong, is it? It can't be. It can't be strong, um, you, the how you're printing it or whatever. Um, well, actually, you're extruding ABS plastic and melting it right into the other layers. So, this stuff is actually very, very strong. Um, I'm going to actually show you how strong it is. Um, here is the clamps I used for the top. And then, um, yeah, it's just chilling here with everything in it. Now, I actually use the the uh, card reader here. I don't even hook it up at all. Um, I will show you really quickly the one place you can access the um, thing I couldn't find in the software. If I go here to control, I go here to motion, and I scroll down to the bottom, it's E steps per millimeter equals whatever. I usually set this at 120, that's what I calibrated. I actually calibrated 118, but I bumped it up 0.2 or 2 millimeters um, per rev. Okay, so it's 120 millimeters per revolution, basically. I believe that's accurate. Uh, no, I'm sorry. That's how many steps per millimeter. My bad. So 120 steps per millimeter. Alright, so I can actually have full control. I can go here and go to prepare and uh, preheat ABS. 
and then go back to main, go to card menu, and print out whatever files I have on there. So real quickly, I am going to uh, go ahead and take this block that I've printed, and I'm going to smash it with a hammer, and I'm going to show you exactly, all right, how tough that this stuff is. I'm going to hit this pretty good. All right. I like that. If I can hit it. I missed. All right. That's it. That little dent's all that happened. Watch out, Snickers. Put your safety glasses on. I'm going to hit it a little harder. Oh. All right. Let's see if we can find it. Okay. So, some people say this stuff isn't very tough. Um, it's a lot tougher than, than you think it is. Alright, I'm hitting that extremely hard. And it is just, it's staying together really well. Okay. Yeah, you can smash it. There, it finally exploded. Oh, well that one's done. So, anyway... A lot of people uh, think that this stuff doesn't print out pretty, you know, tough parts or whatever. Let me put it this way. All of these parts are printed in ABS plastic. Okay? Everything that's actually holding everything together is printed plastic parts. So, self-replicating printer. Alright, well, this is Russ. RWGResearch.com is my website. Be sure and check out a lot of the other work that I've done in the past. always need your guys' support out there to, uh, to keep me going on a lot of these other projects. But this is going to be an extremely handy tool. I can finally print out parts that I need instead of trying to machine parts. Some parts don't need to be precision. Like, for instance, all of these uh, EPG. Um, for those of you who have no idea, something I'm working on. And EPG plates, I could have just printed them out. Spacer, dividers and been done with that. So that's it. Have a good day. Leave me a comment. Let me know what you guys think. Um, and that's it. Peace. See ya. Oh, I did want to do one more thing. I wanted to thank my buddy Jeff uh, and also Fire Pinto. You guys have been working on these 3D printers and kind of got me um, wanting to build one. And Jeff actually sent me a lot of the parts I needed to actually make this whole entire thing. Um, I actually had a lot of these parts about a year ago. Um, and they were for, um, I'm not sure which version printer, but uh, I didn't have time to do it. I didn't have many resources to buy all the parts that, that are needed to do this. So Jeff actually, uh, I hung on to those for about a year, and Jeff actually uh, offered to print out a different style once I found this style because it looked a lot easier and less parts. So he went ahead and printed out all the parts and sent them to me. So thank you, Jeff, for actually... Uh, getting what I needed to actually get started on this thing. So now that I've got it, I can build another one, and I can build another one, and I can print out parts to send to somebody else now and uh, bless them with parts. So anyway, I just want to give you my thanks, Jeff, and uh, yeah, see you.